that Seamus is in Dallas in Texas and uh, we talked to him there a few minutes ago so it's it's early in the morning and I want to thank Seamus for coming in at around eight o'clock. Uh, it, it's, it's a tough area to start talking about um, issues in data usage at that hour of the morning but thanks indeed for doing that and our second speaker then will be Carmel Heaney and we'll say a few words on, on, on Carmel later. So just in, in relation to um, Seamus, and just to give you some background there, Dr. Seamus Dowling is Programme Chair and Lecturer in Cybersecurity at ATU, Lecturer and Researcher at ATU Mayo and University of Texas in, in Dallas. Seamus is also the Co-Founder, Administrator and Academic Instructor of the Cisco Academy at ATU GMIT and a Fulbright Ireland Tech Impact Scholar for 2021-2022. Seamus will speak on emerging issues in data usage. Dr. Seamus Dowling will join us from the University of Texas in Dallas, where he is a visiting Fulbright Scholar researching machine learning usage for IoT cybersecurity at University of Texas Data Security and Privacy Lab. Internet of Things and Internet of Medical Things provide the opportunity to deliver healthcare remotely in the community. It also has the potential to collect vast amounts of data that needs to be securely collated and ethically analysed. Seamus will briefly discuss the technical challenges in doing this as well as introducing legislative and governance responsibilities for organizations in this space. I'd like to welcome from Dallas, Texas, Dr. Seamus Dowling. So, so you, you can. Hi George and hi everybody and thanks very much for that invite uh, and that introduction. Uh, yeah I'm over here it's early morning over here in Dallas I'm just going to share out a few slides not too long it's not going to be a long lecture but it's a very interesting uh, uh, arrangement that University of Texas would have with its uh, partnered partners and its funding opportunities. Uh, certainly it would have big uh, organizations and uh, industry on campus that would they would link in with such as Texas Instruments such as AT&T and it, the, the larger organizations are struggling actually to find graduates uh, to work on R&D particularly and because they can command very high salaries in the industry themselves in core cybersecurity roles so the the a lot of the organizations fund colleges like University of Texas uh, very very well uh, to perform the research for them and by their own admission the industry that is they would argue that perhaps they lose a little bit of uh, control in doing so but it's just the way the the industry has kind of evolved so for example the University of Texas is the second largest computer science department in America and it brought in it brings in millions per year uh, in funding and it, it leverages that to uh, really do some important research in there for the US Army for the Navy for text instruments etc and some of the projects I've been working on and I'm linking in with it have been really really fantastic including uh, launching satellites and looking at the cyber security associated with with satellite operations as well so just very quickly, I'm just going to share a few slides. And uh, as I say, because I've only got about 10 or 15 minutes here to talk, I'm going to limit it just to a number of uh, bullet points here. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is actually uh, Internet of Things and Internet of Medical Things themselves and the vulnerabilities associated with them. I'm going to go on and talk a little bit about data usage and governance, which is not just alone GDPR, but when it comes to cybersecurity, there, there are specific directives, uh, law and legal frameworks that have to be adhered to. And I suppose, as George alluded to there in the introduction, uh, we also have master's fellowship students. Uh, we, Carmel and I were involved in just interviewing there during the week. 
so we will have uh, master's students uh, lined up to start in September. So it would really be beneficial for that for the student and for some uh, client organization to be able to leverage uh, both the research and the, the students time to um, be involved in some very meaningful uh, work. So if I suppose to start off, if, if anybody Googles or looks at what Internet of Medical Things uh, looks like, invariably you're going to find some kind of an image like this where somebody is using a PD, uh, their their um, tablet or their phone to be able to control all the various telemetries associated with medical uh, devices. And we do that. We've already bought into that concept to some extent insofar as we, you know, we all have Fitbits or, or some of us have smart watches. And we, we willingly give that data into the cloud for some kind of analytical tool to be able to look and analyze that data and you know help us sleep better or analyze the number of steps we take, et cetera. So you know, we've already the, the concept of this Internet of Medical Things already exists to some extent, but I suppose we it really needs to kind of broaden out for it to be a much more meaningful implementation. And I suppose as we try and uh, deliver healthcare more into the community, then uh, the, the connections from cloud services to all the end devices associated with medical things needs to be much more comprehensive. And in my view, coming from a cybersecurity perspective, every dotted line that I see on this image over here, every dashed line, every communication line is itself an attack vector that is uh, open for uh, exploitation by threat groups. And that's kind of worrying because there has been lots of known attacks on in, uh, specifically targeting Internet of Things. And about five years ago, there was a large scale distributed denial of service attack that targeted um, what was called a busy box operating system that was predominantly used on uh, IoT. And that was called that cyber attack was called Mirai. And whereas, you know, it's not too critical if they're turn if that attack um, compromises maybe a street light, it turns on and off the street light. But if we're compromising end medical devices or the telemetry gathering, then that has much more implications. And I suppose, you know, if I want to kind of demonstrate some lies, damn lies, the statistics, depending on uh, what report you look at. This one is just so I brought up is the Deloitte Center for Health Solutions. It's three bullet points there that I just kind of put up just as a conversation pieces. The IOMT marketplace is estimated to be 158 billion and it's going to grow, you can see, to 254 billion. Uh, the device is already deployed globally somewhere in the region of 20 to 30 billion. Now, I imagine a lot of that has got to do with wearables. A lot of it got to do with the Fitbits that you know, probably can be found in the back of somebody's drawer at this stage and uh, smartwatches and that kind of thing. But we are, we do and we are moving more, as I say, into deploying um, more complex medical devices into into the community, uh, such as ambulance services, uh, such as remote monitoring, such as remote care. And uh, uh, just one statistic is healthcare companies who have already deployed OMT. It's it's growing. It's into 60 percent. And there are some instances, even in Ireland, St. James's Hospital, for example, which is going much more down the road of rolling out Internet of Medical Things. I suppose any presentation wouldn't be without its dramatic headlines. And we, we have lots of cases, as I mentioned, the Mirai botnet uh, targeted IoT specifically, but there are other vulnerabilities known in the area of Internet of Medical Things. And we have had cases whereby uh, devices and, and um, very uh, important and critical infrastructure in the area of medical uh, devices, such as insulin pumps and uh, um, infusion pumps, uh, have been compromised. And arguments and lots of discussion around how we actually best secure Internet of Medical Things uh, cyber attacks. And I, I suppose one of the protocols I'm just going to talk about now in, in, uh, is something called Zigbee and Zigbee is a known uh, IOMT communicating protocol. And indeed, as a part of a research a number of years ago, I actually wandered around. I, I have this um, sniffing device that it's able to capture uh, pro, uh, traffic on what's called 802.15.4 uh, communications channels. And I was able to wander around and pick up open or plain text data that was being uh, sent around around the Galway region. I won't specifically mention uh, what organizations I went into, but uh, they were using uh, 
communication protocols such as this and I was able to capture them and they weren't encrypted and they were pretty much open source plain text. So if I look, I suppose I'm very much I'm concentrating on the technical side of things uh, initially. So if we look at the entire picture of what Internet of Medical Things might look like, and every one of these end devices is some kind of an IOMT sensor, then at a hardware level, we're looking at very small microcontrollers, Arduinos, Raspberries, Galileos. I'm working on Texas Instruments over here. And I suppose what sometimes these can be considered either full function devices or reduced function devices. And if it's reduced function devices, that means they don't have the footprint or the real estate to be able to implement robust encryption or authentication measures. And indeed, some protocols make it uh, optional that they actually implement such uh, robust um, encryption. So what we that's why I'm saying we could pick up open our plain text traffic on over the air. And some of those at the hardware level, the communication protocols, again, this is very technical. So for people who are working in this space, you would recognize a lot of the protocols such as IEEE 802.15.4. We know Bluetooth, Zigbee, LoRaWAN, any of the cellular networks such as 3G, 4G, 5G or LTE, uh, Wi-Fi, RFED and Z-Wave, they are all, these protocols are all used to communicate information from the end device to some kind of a collecting um, gateway or a hub. And the comms itself, so they're just at a hardware level, the communication that needs to be stacked on the IOMT device as well, uh, might require anything from communication protocols, HTTP, S, and then there's very specific ones associated with internet things such as MQTT, co-op, and then we need to implement some encoding on top of that and maybe programming in the area of uh, JSON or XML or data representation. And then we have to put in encryption on authentication. And so you can see that the small IOT or IOMT sensors all of a sudden need to be nearly more powerful than a, a normal computer uh, because they have to implement all these um, communication protocols or, or robustness or encryption, et cetera. And then of course they have to go, to, they have to be able to, these devices have to be able to send information to the cloud so it can be analyzed. Uh, I put in here with an asterisk HL7, so people in this space would recognize the HL7 message format globally adopted. Uh, to be able to kind of communicate information. Uh, I put in uh, some open source projects such as OpenHab, which is an open smart home, uh, open source smart home project. And of course, if we are looking at rolling out healthcare to the community, then we do need to have some kind of um, a smart home integration. Google Health are big in this space, are, are, as are Apple, as I've already mentioned. And I put an asterisk beside Microsoft's health fault because about three years ago, Microsoft scrapped their big project, which they had poured millions into, which was called HealthFob. And they felt they couldn't get the integration, they couldn't get the social buy-in to be able to implement a, a, a full integrated IOMT. There was too many challenges there. So that was an interesting uh, kind of case study in its own right. And of course, all this traffic needs to be um, modeled or visualized and then perform some kind of data analytics and some kind of machine learning. And I suppose if I wanted to kind of bore everybody about what I'm working on over here, it's very much around the area of machine learning. And we're using a specific type of learning called federated learning, whereby the end devices themselves are responsible for doing the data analytics, uh, which again puts more pressure on the actual re the, the, the processing power associated with an IOMT sensor. So a lot of organizations might decide to say, right, let's just get the communication side of things. Let's get the data harvested and collected and sent. And we'll worry about all the other stuff towards the end, such as the machine learning or the analytics. We just need to collate the data and do something with it. And a lot of times, if you're working on a very small product, small um, processing power, then maybe encryption and authentication is something that is kind of left towards the end of the uh, development cycle. And uh, I suppose that's what I'm working on over here with the with using some kind of a machine learning that's small enough to be able to encrypt and 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 secure the data before it's actually sent to the cloud or central hub, et cetera. And I, I'm moving off the technical side. I think you'd be glad to hear and look at some of the regulatory or uh, legal frameworks. So we have kind of we have two elements in the EU. We have what's called the NIST directive. Now I'm not even talking about GDPR or or um, uh, data Protection Acts or anything like that. I'm specifically talking about um, directives and frameworks that are purely for cybersecurity. 
So we have a, an EU NIST directive that's out there and it's soon to be NIST 2. And that's a legal requirement and it's in being, uh, NIST 2 is, is going through the final stages in the European Union. And in the US, they have what's called a NIST framework, which is voluntary, but it is required or mandatory if you're working with the government or you're in, engaged in any subcontracting with federal uh, organizations. And if I just kind of bring up this big spiel associated with what the NIST directive is all about, it says to respond to an increased exposure of Europe to cyber threats, the NIST 2 directive now covers medium and large entities uh, from more sectors that are critical for the economy and society. So really what they're looking at there is critical infrastructure. So, you know, communication services, digital services, wastewater, waste management, energy, et cetera. Um, and, but I put it down here at the end, NIST 2 directive, it also covers more broadly the healthcare sectors, for example, by including medical device manufacturers. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is for this last point that I'm, I'm, I'm just displaying on screen now. Because the NIST 2 directive also strengthens cybersecurity requirements imposed on companies, uh, addresses security of supply chains and supplier relationship. And this is the most critical element associated with what the NIST 2 directive is and introduces accountability of top management for non-compliance with cybersecurity obligations. So if a company either is uh, gets hit by a ransomware and pays that ransomware or gets hit by a ransomware and don't uh, make their um, their infrastructure more secure or more robust, then they are open to, to um, penalties. And so that NIST 2 directive, as I said, is going through the final stages and it does have implications for anybody that is processing data or uh, considering some kind of a cybersecurity element to their product. Um, I suppose if I look at the, the, the voluntary framework, I'm going on to the next slide here, uh, which is very much more about compliance. So if you're looking at it, maybe something like the US NIST directive uh, or NIST framework, which is voluntary, but you can go through the controls and the processes to show that you, you have got the paperwork by, by completing at various controls, and you demonstrated that you are regularly regulatory compliant by uh, doing so. And there are so many of them out there, and they are, you know, we might recognize ISO, for example, but specifically the NIST cybersecurity framework over on the left hand side. There's other ones dedicated for um, pay, uh, credit cards, such as PCI, there's other ones for um, dedicated for healthcare, such as HIPAA, H I P A A. And then there's lots of other ones such as CIS, and these are all compliance standards. And you can just fill these, you can actually complete these yourself. They're quite complicated piece of paperwork, but you can complete these and demonstrate that you are compliant. However, that's fine uh, if you're able to do that, but with this NIST 2 directive, the EU directive that's coming in, you're going to have to kind of go another step further to demonstrate that you have made your organization more secure. So it's it's interesting times ahead when it comes to the governance of uh, cybersecurity. And I suppose if you're kind of worried, thinking about, well, where do I start with all this? I suppose I'll give you one takeaway on this. Uh, and as I said, I haven't even mentioned GDPR. I'm not an expert on that. The UK version of GDPR, the Data Protection Act. And over in, in the US, what we're looking at now is a implementing an equivalent of GDPR, which is called the Washington Privacy Act. And that's... a because they don't have the equivalent of GDPR over here, is very much voluntary, as I mentioned. But if I kind of give you one takeaway from this is there is a product called Microsoft Purview. Uh, you can try it for free. Uh, and if you're, it's built on the Azure platform. So a lot of people might already be on Azure, uh, but it's quite complex, quite complicated. There is a link there if you want to go and check it out. And if you do scroll down through this, you'll come across uh, really good uh, documentation associated with and I just highlighted here if your organization needs to comply with legal or regulatory standards start here to learn about compliance using Microsoft Purview obviously it's infrastructure as a service uh, using Azure and I suppose Purview could be considered software as a service so just like any of these cloud products the more you use it the more you pay for it but it does give you a, tri a free trial for, for working on it and great documentation I, I recommend just going away and having to read through some of these just to give you an idea of what that might be. And I suppose the last thing I want to talk about is, this, as uh, George uh, mentioned and Carmel will probably talk about as well, is our master's fellowship. Uh, as I mentioned, we already interviewed for our student, uh, for an app applicants for this, and we have uh, somebody going forward uh, for it. It'll 
probably a case that will start in September, October. Uh, and they are going to look at the whole landscape associated with IOMT in Ireland and how much is being deployed and cybersecurity concerns associated with that. So they would be bringing in everything associated with what I've just talked about there from the technical side of things and also from the legal side of things as well, and maybe regulatory and governance frameworks. And if it's really, it could be really beneficial for a client, uh, I help client or organ organization to be able to kind of work with a student like this or because it would be brilliant exposure and research for the student and a client would also get the benefit of actually having a student work on specific concept, as it's mentioned, for example, maybe some of the governance and legal frameworks associated with that. And uh, that is it. So I'm just going to stop sharing my screen. Thanks very much, everybody. Thanks, George and Maria and Tarlock and Hannah for everybody for organizing and inviting me along for this. Great, and thanks, uh, Seamus. Thanks indeed. And I should say just that, uh, to confirm for everyone that this event is being recorded, so <clears throat> you'll be able to get it on our YouTube channels indeed for some of the people that, that couldn't come today or, or for there's more people online. Um, so thanks in, indeed, to Seamus, uh, from coming in all the way from, from Dallas and giving us that update. Like you covered critical things like the IoT and the Internet of Medical things, and indeed some points on, on cyber attacks and the sort of policies around that. Um, and then, you know, your area was technical looking at that initially, and then you moved on to the sort of regulations and, and compliance. And then finally on the, the master's fellowship as a sort of a, an example of maybe of what we're, we're trying to get to here. So the second part of the update today is moving more towards how we might implement some of that uh, merging, if you like, between the academic people and the IHUB clients that are here. So Carmel's, the topic that Carmel is going to speak about is engaging with and optimizing early academic partnerships. And I think that's really uh, what we're, we're, we're trying to look at. And I suppose this is probably the first of two events. We do plan to run another follow-up event uh, in October um, sort of follow on from today and indeed anyone that's uh, looking to you know has queries they can email Carmel or Seamus directly and just CC us in, in the IHUB here and we will follow up. So just I want to um, welcome Carmel. Carmel is here present in, in the IHUB which is great and um, Dr. Carmel Heaney is a senior lecturer and researcher at ATU Mayo. Carmel has been working in the health research field since 2004. She has significant experience in research design and project management in both clinical and medtech domains. An awardee of a health service research training fellowship from the Health Research Board, Carmel completed her PhD in public health medicine and epidemiology in 2012. Her research experience spans both the hospital and community settings representing collaborations between academic and industry research groups. Carmel has experience in fund procurement, study design, project management and scientific writing. She has significant experience in research and funding applications in this space and has published a number of papers on associated topics in high level international peer reviewed journals. Carmel has a particular interest in population health, chronic illness management, and connected health in this context and welcomes opportunities to collaborate and engage with community and industry stakeholders interested in project work or this research. Carmel will speak this evening on engaging with and optimizing early academic partnerships. Dr. Carmel Heaney will provide attendees with an insight into how industry university engagement may be worth exploring, the types of research engagement and how to critically start these conversations. I'd like now to welcome Carmel to the podium. Thank you, George, and thanks to the IHUBs for having me here today. Um, I'm going to just pick up on where Seamus left off. I suppose Seamus is 
has spoken about a particular angle that's very relevant to digital health and is increasingly pertinent, that idea of security. But there are multiple dimensions that inform quality digital health provision and digital health information um, advancing. And that is one angle. And I'll talk a little bit about thinking outside the box for innovation companies and, and um, how you can engage with academic institutions to that end. Um, when I talk about engaging uh, with and optimizing early academic partnerships, I'm going to speak a little bit about why, what motivates the university to look out for and engage with innovation partners, and um, why that is something that the innovation hub companies should think about. Um, what, where are the benefits for you? There needs to be benefits. Um, what types of relationships can be fostered and how to go about in initiating engagement uh, with institutes such as the ATU. Um, so why universities engage with industry? Well, firstly, we need to take the macro remit of any higher education institution. And our ATU spans a very large geographical region, approximately the size of Wales. And our ultimate mandate is to support regional need. And that's through education, innovation and research and support regional growth in doing that. It's to retain expertise in the area and provide pathways for companies, for researchers, uh, for educators to um, develop sound collaborations and really punch with the best in terms of that. And we've done that in some sectors internationally, but we can expand that area. We've been very successful in med tech in this area down the Western seaboard. And that has come from early industry collaboration and research integrated with education solutions. We want to expand that into other areas, including digital health. Um, we also want um, a motivator from a university point of view is that our research is informed by need and experience. So we want to be collaborating with innovators and next generation solutions. Um, if that's for both research output, but also our educational outputs, those collaborations and, and having those conversations with industry experts is really important to inform our students and provide solid, meaningful pathways for students coming out of the ATU. Um, the translational research pathway is really important. There are lots of ideas all around us every day, uh, but have we pathways to mobilize those into solid outputs and can we retain those in our region? Um, and access to unique resources. So many companies are working with data, solutions, innovation, um, that the universities are keen to be part of and, and to access and try and test those solutions. Um, and the joint pursuit of opportunities um, and then developing alumni connections and supporting alumni. And I suppose in terms of metrics, um, a very important output for ATU staff and university staff across the country is impact. And we evidence that by partnerships and um, by impactful collaborations by delivering um, good quality research, by gaining grant funding and by publication. So there are a lot of motivators there on the university side. And to look at it, you know, what's in it for the industry. Why would industry come in and collaborate? Can you hear me better there now? Um, well, the innovative ideas. So often industry, are, especially startups and early stage uh, companies are coming forward with innovative ideas, um, but they don't have the capacity or manpower to expand those ideas rapidly. And sometimes getting more heads around the table um, can lead to conversations and, and taking things to new levels more rapidly. Um, the other thing that's important is that independent validation of solutions. Um, so whether historically that's drugs or digital innovation or you know, whatever your innovative solution is, it might be a new process, a new system. Um, it is important to test that independently and get it validated. And obviously the universities have a, a core group of people um, that are that are well primed to do that. Um, access to intellectual property, um, the network access and expansion. Uh, so that builds upon the point I made last, that, that the importance of um, networking in. It's very easy to be in a silo, in an iHub, in your office in the iHub, 
but actually equally it's easy to be in a silo in a large academic institution and sometimes that isn't realized from the outside and um, the access to funding streams and we're seeing increasingly that grants coming across email to us are looking for co-design they're looking for collaboration it's not one person designing a project and going with it they want to see a few heads around the table and we know that that is more impactful it will deliver better bang for buck back to the funding body okay so and then expansion of working groups so startup companies are obviously tight on resource you might have two people in the startup initially then a third and it can be quite difficult to find the funds to expand the working team so early collaboration and maybe getting research students on board or a, an academic team or a scientific team around the the, the uh, solution being created and um, just offers more back to that company and again the motivation the joint pursuit of opportunities and um, when we look at this issue of mutality, and um, again, the working in silos is what we want to avoid. We have expertise all around us. We have it in the IHOPs, we have it in the different departments across the ATU. Um, and it's to find a way to connect the right people to each other. And, um, you know, there is no doubt that large talent pool is there on the doorstep. And um, the opportunity to co-design is very powerful. And sometimes when we're maybe in digital health, we're looking at a particular app in a particular disease. It may or not may not be a, an academic partner in that disease area you want. Maybe it's someone um, like what Seamus has talked about that you want the privacy and security side, or maybe it's the software side. So um, it, it's not as linear as it can feel when you're starting out that maybe the person you want to network is tangential to what you're doing, but will bring it all together more quickly. And um, the grant funding opportunities are really important. Okay, I've mentioned the, the, the core design, the potential to get MSc students to work on projects and mobilize what you're trying to deliver as, as a small startup company in an iHub, but equally the ATU gets opportunity to put more students through in very relevant, timely research topics. And some of those have the potential to advance to PhD um, level as well. And there are many other reasons why one would engage. And the types of relationships, um, it, you may be just looking for some consultation, you know, some small inputs into project design or statistical analysis. Uh, you may be looking for larger contractors research and um, maybe co-creation of new solutions. You're, you're developing one solution, but you're seeing a potential fit with something else, but don't have in-house expertise. Come in and talk to someone in the institute or in the ATU and see where that could be brought to next. And um, I've talked about the evaluation contracts or test bed studies um, and looking at the effectiveness of if maybe technology, a, a hard tangible product or a service. Um, membership of research clusters so we're birthing research clusters across the ATU all of the time and as part of becoming a university this is going to be a growth area for us and um, so when you look up our website and see research clusters in particular areas more will be coming on stream in time once the, the internal system is organized in that way obviously many of you that are already in the iHubs you're availing of the space and, and incubation but some of you online today aren't direct IHUB clients, you're, you're working in other areas and that's another offering that's there across the ATU. And then strategic partnerships. And th this is what this is about. You know, today we're addressing maybe early ideas, small companies, but as you grow and um, we can develop out strategic partnerships in larger areas. In terms of the ATU itself, um, I'll just speak broadly for a minute. Um, there is, there are a lot of very research active groups at the ATU and um, our institutes independently before we formed an ATU had research clusters. Now they're all uh, coming together. So across uh, the counties within the ATU, there are a lot of research groups and um, they cross a lot of different disciplinary areas. So as I said, you don't have to have this direct thematic alignment to your product our output, it may be reaching into a different cluster for a different element of the solution. And um, 
So the, the, those I won't go into all the areas today because uh, they are quite broad and evolving, but there's more information on the ATU website on that. Um, but I just want to bring to your attention, in addition to the defined research clusters and research centres, outside of that, there are other academics with a lot of expertise, subject matter expertise in particular areas. So if you look up the ATU and don't see a particular cluster formed or a particular research centre, don't discount still reaching out and looking for individuals with expertise because we're still mapping and growing in that area, but they do exist. Um, and the other thing to bring to your attention in the context of health is that the ATU uh, departments um, have very well established clinical relationships with uh, clinical providers, both public and private. And, um, you know, that many of those are quite research active and open to conversations on research engagement. So again, by coming in and speaking to us, we may be able to signpost you and uh, create channels of communication for you in that sense. Um, because this is a digital health event, there's one research centre I'm going to draw your attention to. Um, our thematic area is digital health and in ATU Mayo we have a centre called the EPIC Research Centre. And EPIC stands for Environmental, Person-Centred, Integrated and Connected. And it's a centre for research and community engagement. And our focus there is interdisciplinary research. It's, it's that idea that most research projects are not linear and a lot of grant funding opportunities are looking for that collaboration integrated approach. And that's what we aim to do. So we're focused on applied and collaborative health and community based research. We've quite a number of academics that are engaged there and um, with interest uh, in exploring areas um, of digital health, but other areas, but particular to digital health, we have the angles of public health knowledge, chronic illness, healthcare analytics or statistics, healthcare management, connected health and public po and health policy. Um, and that group are interested in looking at co-collaboration on projects, on grant funding and um, research project co-design, partnerships for designing research fellowships. They can be sponsored by companies and, um, you know, where you might have a, a staff member you want to take on, but what will keep them with you is engaging them in a, a research master's and you might want to sponsor that and have co-design on that. But equally, there are grant opportunities to come across our desk and um, that are looking for either co-funding or they're exclusively funded by particular bodies, but they want us as academics to partner with industry. And uh, th there are areas that I think there's great potential to collaborate on. Um, to that end, and I'm nearly finished now, it's, it's where do I start? Uh, so some of our audience are from the iHubs today. Uh, some of our audience are my academic colleagues who are keen to engage in research. Um, and I suppose it brings back to the conversation when Seamus and I went to George initially, it was on the back of seeing research funding opportunities come in for these uh, master's fellowships. And, you know, Seamus and I realised in conversation, we didn't know what was in our eye hooks and what industries were there. We, we knew about med tech, but we, there were other areas we didn't know about. And we, we felt that if we had had earlier conversations and ourselves re reached out earlier, as the grant fund opportunities come along, we will be able to bounce quicker and pick up a phone more quickly and and uh, get conversations going around project design. So our advice would be, where do we start? It's proactively reaching out on both sides, be, be, be it academic, be it large industry out there. I know we have some HSE colleagues online and um, are the iHubs. Reach out, you know, who is doing what, where? Who's interested in what? what what do we need as, from an industry point of view? Um, what solutions can individual academics or cluster centres offer industry? Um, and then the other, in those early conversations, it, it's about relationship building and finding people you think that's someone I'd really like to work with. Um, you know, I, seeing the synergy where your organisation is getting satisfaction out of what's being proposed and that there's alignment to the advancing your own business strategy. 
And that there's a sense of commitment. Commitment's really important and collaborations do take time and investment and a lot of conversation before things actually happen. But that's part of everything. Um, you know, so be sure that both parties are committed to making it work and getting a mutual win-win scenario. <clears throat> and I suppose the take home message is no conversation happens too early in this space. You, you know, you may open a door to someone you already know um, and you mightn't have the solution, but you might be able to signpost the person. And that's particularly for those of us working within the ATU. If, if the IHUB client companies reach out and you can't help them directly, can you signpost them onwards? Um, get conversation going. Look to be connected, you know, um, build relationships, know who you'd like to work with and develop uh, project pipelines. This is really important. Um, you know, even though budgets can be tight and small, both internally and externally, we should have an aspiration and roadmap of where we want to bring our work, both academically and from a research point of view. And um, so have we wish lists and include target, but also tangential projects. You know, for example, security might be on your immediate radar if you're developing digital innovation. Um, but it's going to come into the framework somewhere along the way for you as, 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 you, as you navigate the research pathway. So um, do you need support on that? And there, there are other angles to think about. So think outside the box, what information or research would be of benefit to in establishing a need for your innovation? Even does the market need to be scoped, for example? You might be relying on international evidence. Is there Irish evidence? Is there European evidence? You know, what would be scoped out in that sense and approach the academic institutions for this. Uh, the timelines for grant funding can be very tight and they're not the ideal time for the introductions. It's the early conversations, putting down little markers, getting everyone thinking. And then as we see opportunities come up, we know who to pick up a phone to and say, look, at, we talked about this before. Can we pick it up again? And um, so they're just, as I said, a bite size idea of, of how we can start engagement and conversations and I just want to thank you uh, for your attention and thank George and Maria at the ATUI hubs for the invitation to speak to you today. That's great. That's great, Carmel. Thanks very much. Um, it was it was great um, to get the update there. Look, you looked at areas like, you know, why should we engage with the research and then how should we engage? And indeed, like, what are the joint benefits, you know, for both IO clients and for academia that, that this, you know, in this process? Um, and then you talked about the Epic Centre, which is a um, very interesting area and the, the whole area of digital health. And I think all of the, you know, the areas, the sub areas that you brought out there, as I look at the clients in the IHUB, there's a whole load of collaboration that I'm convinced we could get. Like all the areas that you mentioned, a lot of our device companies even now, where they were traditionally in vitro devices, there's a lot of sensors and all that stuff being built around them. So the IoT, the, the, the Internet of Medical things, as Seamus alluded to earlier, I think there's very, very significant opportunities there. And then you finished off with, you know, the, the reach out. And I think that's the key thing. And the point is to start the conversations. And as I said earlier, this is the first of two of these that we'll do. So what we want people to do is to indicate to us what area they'd like to do some potential research in. They can <clears throat> email Seamus and Carmel directly. They can email ourselves in the IHUB in, in Galway or, or in Mayo and just give us an indication of what the areas are. We then need to start some early engagement, some discussions, maybe throw in a bit of coffee. These are the important things that we need to do to get that going. And really, you know, the aim here and the goal here is that we would like to bring additional talent to the startups that we have in the ATU iHubs. Uh, and now indeed we have four iHubs going forward um, when, when we include Sligo uh, Centre and we include Letterkenny. So there's loads and loads of opportunities there and we would love to be able to bring master students and even PhD students and bring that talent and expertise to support the clients. So 
I know we won't get uh, a lot of questions or anything today because this was really just a primer event to float out the idea, to say that we're here. As Carmel said, when, when herself and Seamus saw the sort of presentation and looked at what's happening in the hubs, now we have that platform available. We have that opportunity to make that engagement and the beneficiaries will be the clients themselves who engage in that and the ATU. So I'd like to finish off at that. And before I do, I just want to thank a few people. First and foremost, I want to thank Seamus and Carmel because without them, we wouldn't have the event today. I think there's a, a lot of food for thought there. And I think there's, there's real, real opportunities for engagement. Secondly, I want to thank Maria in, in Mayo IHUB for actually facilitating the early discussions because um, Carmel and Seamus were, were based in Mayo and we had the discussions there. Um, and finally, I just want to thank my own team here of Turlock and Hannah and, and, and Mary in relation to helping to put on the event today. It's very, very important that we do this and we're really looking forward to the follow up. So email us, uh, let us know and uh, we will work on these with you for the benefit of all. Thank you very much.